All right, and we're recording. Hey gang, Andy here, coming at you, Book, with a very special episode. Yes, today is my 100th episode of Andy Japandi. And uh, normally with uh, the Andy Japandi series, I show off a uh, select portion of Japan, you know, maybe like a little touristy spot or just uh, talk about Japan, maybe show off the different foods and things like that that they have out here. But today for the 100th episode, um, I got a lot of ideas from Facebook and stuff like that and just polling random people about different uh, stuff that I want to do to make this uh, 100th episode very special. And uh, it's a lot of great ideas, um, definitely not discounting them, and I might be able to get a couple of them out before I have to leave this wonderful place, but uh, we'll see <laughs> if time allows. But uh, anyway, kind of rambling here. But uh, with today's episode being that it's the 100th episode, like I said, I want to do something special. And today I want to talk to you guys about my influences for uh, coming out to Japan. So uh, let's. Uh, Let's start from the beginning, huh? So, um, as some of you guys know, if you tuned into my uh, interview on the Just Japan podcast, episode three, with the uh, lovely Busan Kevin, also known as uh, Jalen Kev, Kevin O'Shea, whatever you want to call him, um, I talked about uh, what influenced me uh, in the beginning to come out to Japan and just what interests me in Japan in general. So, uh, just to recap from that, um, I was really uh, inspired by my cousins. They are a mostly military family, so a lot of them were in the service. And my cousin, who uh, retired as a senior chief uh, a while back, about a decade or so ago, he was stationed out here in Yokosuka on the uh, USS The Sullivans back when it was uh, homeported out here. So he was out here for like the early to mid 90s or so. And I, I remember as a kid, always getting stuff sent to me in the mail by my cousins. They would send me uh, like just little Japanesey things like bowls, chopsticks, cups, things like that, you know. It's really cool. But uh, the thing that really inspired me for, you know, that really kind of piqued my interest with Japan initially was they sent me a little Lego toy boat set. It was just like a little box and it had the boat and a little minifig and stuff like that. It's really simple, but um, one of the cool things is, uh, for those who have purchased Legos before, I, I don't know who's watching, but you, uh, what's in the box usually is just uh, like the, the blocks, obviously, and a little instruction booklet on how to put it together, and a little pamphlet for uh, featuring the uh, Lego sets and stuff like that. So it showed off like uh, back in the 90s, uh, Space Set was really popular, Pirates were really popular. Uh, Ninjas didn't come out till the mid 90s, mid to late 90s, just then. So, um, but since this uh, little Lego toy boat set was uh, bought in Japan, the uh, language and everything was written in Japanese. Now, keep in mind, this was the early to mid 90s, so there wasn't a lot of Japanese stuff to be had in small town Ohio at that time, and there certainly wasn't uh, an internet to look up Japanese stuff, you know. <laughs> there was, was a long ways from YouTube and, you know, Google and all that kind of stuff. So, really, the only uh, frame of reference I had for Japan was uh, the stuff my cousins would send me and just stuff in books and dictionaries and encyclopedias. I mean, that's really all I had at the time. So when I got this Lego toy boat set with the little pamphlet that had the Japanese characters, I thought that was just super cool. So I remember just always carrying it around with me and just every once in a while, you know, pulling it out of my pocket and just look at it. It's like, oh, this is so cool, man. I don't know what it's saying. I don't know what it is, but it's so different. It's so cool. And so that really uh, sparked my interest in Japan to begin with. And plus, I was really close with my cousins at the time. They're basically like a second family to me. So. You know, just wherever they were, you know, I really miss them and, you know, getting to see some of the stuff that they sent me and stuff like that. You know, I remember uh, one time uh, my cousin sent me uh, a little a set of the Japanese coins and had like little uh, letter and stuff on the back saying, you know, what each coin was. So, you know, they had, she had like the, uh, like the one yen coin, the yeni. It's like, this is one yen, this is equivalent to like a penny or so, and you know, this is a 10 yen coin, which is, you know, 
10 cents, you know, 50 yen, so on and so forth, up to the 500 yen coin, which is equivalent to five dollars American. So I just thought it was so cool because it's so exotic and you know it's awesome. So uh, just fast forward a little bit more. A lot of Japanese shows that I grew up watching that at the time I didn't even know were Japanese. Uh, two that really come to mind are, of course, Power Rangers, which was based off of the Super Sentai series here in Japan. Uh, the original Mighty Morphin was based off of a show called uh, Zoo Ranger. So um, I didn't know it was Japanese until much later when you know I had the internet and stuff like that. I was like, oh, it was based off of some show in Japan. That's pretty cool and uh, stuff like that. And also, uh, just cartoons here and there, you know, like Samurai Pizza Cats. I didn't know originally came from Japan. I thought it was just a cartoon about Japan. I didn't know it actually came from Japan. And then, uh, I, I remember watching some of the Miyazaki films. Uh, the one I remember was uh, watching uh, Totoro when I was a kid, because it was this really popular film at the time, in like the mid-90s. So I was like, okay, I'll watch it, you know, hey, I like cartoons, I'm a kid, <laughs> So like that, so I put it in, and, you know, keep in mind, I was a kid, super ADD, I didn't really know that cartoons could be, you know, not all wacky, crazy slapstick stuff, so, at the time, I was just kind of bored by it, I was just kind of confused, I'm like, it's kind of like Disney, but there's not much music, and the characters are kind of weird, and... I just didn't get it as a kid, so, you know, I, I like it now, but back then it was just kind of confusing. Oh, another cartoon series, just kind of random thought neuron just popped in my head. Uh, another cartoon series I remember watching as a kid that was based in Japan, um, Ronin Warriors. That was another big one I remember watching and just loving. Um, another one... Uh, I just lost it. <laughs> anyway, uh, Ronin Warriors, that's another big one. So, um, yeah, I was really interested in that. And of course, Transformers. Um, that was uh, based off of a toy line in Japan. So when that came over to the States, that was another big part of my very early childhood. And later on, when they released the Beast Wars series, that was another big part of my elementary school days <laughs> back in the 90s. So, yeah. Um, but moving on later, you know, towards my junior high, high school life, you know, that was the big anime boom of America. So you had stuff like uh, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball, Outlaw Star, Cowboy Bebop, Trigun. All these different anime shows came out, and it was just very exciting. And it was just like, this is so cool, you know, I'd always watch uh, to the Toonami block, you know, Midnight Run. Uh, when Adult Swim came out, they had their own little anime block on uh, Saturdays, I believe it was. So I'd always tune in for that, but every once in a while, like, near the end of its, like, super anime boom, they would always schedule anime at really weird hours. So, like, I didn't want to stay up to, like, four or five in the morning just to watch an episode of Inuyasha or something like that. So eventually I kind of stopped with the Toonami and then moved on uh, to actually buying DVDs and stuff like that online, because I remember my best friend, Talking Vidalkin, also known as Ariopolis, uh, I remember he bought this anime called Excel Saga, and it was just so different from the stuff I'd seen on Toonami, because, you know, as far as anime goes, I figured the stuff that was on Toonami was like the end all be all, right? You know, I didn't really know any better. So I saw this and I'm like, this is so cool. So I decided to look up other anime series that hadn't quite made it to America. So from there I went to Rama One Half, which was another big series for me, and then just kind of exploded from there, really. So, <laughs> and this is of course when uh, anime, you know, I learned about, you know, downloading anime and now streaming is a big one, so I don't really do the downloading thing anymore. So I just stream it legally, legitly, of course. So, um, and from there, yeah, I'm here, out in Japan. And also, um, another influence I want to talk to you guys about, which is kind of, you know, fairly recent, you know, this is like the mid-2000s when YouTube first started up. Uh, I remember looking up just random stuff about Japan, life in Japan, things like that. And I came across uh, a couple videos 
Uh, one by a guy who doesn't really do vi uh, YouTube videos anymore. I found his through a Google video, which is uh, now defunct pretty much. And it was a long, like, half hour video of his life in Japan. He made two videos. One of them was in the wintertime, which is the first one I saw. And then the second one was in the summertime. It was just kind of like a, a day in the life sort of video. Um, it was really interesting about this guy who lived in uh, Oita in Japan. This was very, very Inaka, very rural, rural. <laughs> I can say that, very countryside. So it didn't have all the nice amenities and the flashing lights of Tokyo or Osaka or something like that. So it was really interesting to see him like fill up his bathtub and he had to like turn on the little heater thing and make sure it was like ready to go and then he would fill it up with hot water and stuff like that. So it was kind of interesting just to see where technology and just stuff like that was in Japan. It was a very different take on, you know, life in Japan. It wasn't all, you know, made robots and flashing lights and, you know, crazy cat ladies running around and, you know, Akihabara or something like that. So I thought that was really interesting. That got me into looking up the uh, burgeoning J-vlogging community. So J-vlogging is uh, a short shortening of the term Japan vlogger or Japan video logger, so this is a vlog. So, um, a lot of the initial J bloggers, you know, came up around that time. So, you had guys like Tokyo Kuni, uh, the late great Roger Swan when he was Tokyo Swan, doing the Tokyo Swan thing. Um, Busan Kevin came later. Uh, Give me break, man, Victor. He was he wasn't really doing Japanesey stuff at the time. He was just mostly talking about internet drama and stuff like that. So I just I kind of avoided that scene because I didn't want to get into the uh, the drama scene. It wasn't really my thing. So there was that um, and just a bunch of other day vloggers that came out during that time. Reynolds Air was another one. Um, just so many, so many. I can't even begin to name them all because this video will get like stupid long. And uh, oh, TQ Sam's another one, of course, one of the early, early J vloggers that I watch and still watch. So, yeah. Um, and as the community grew, split it off into different uh, niches of the J vlogging community, you have uh, it's mostly like women and stuff like that doing, you know, the fashion thing or like, hey, I'm a cute foreigner in Japan kind of thing. And that's their thing, and you know, that's cool, you know. So it's always nice to see new people coming in, into the scene and seeing, you know, their take on life in Japan. And yeah, it is kind of sad to see them go, you know, when they eventually have to go back to their home country or move to another country to continue on with their lives. And yeah, it's sad to see them go, but you're also kind of happy for them because you see their life in Japan, you kind of get to know them and to see where they've come from. And it's like, you know what? These guys are gonna be all right. You know, they're gonna do good things. And sometimes they continue to make videos after Japan, but most of the time they don't. They just kind of drop off the face of the earth, which is really sad to be honest. You know, you get to know them and, you know, start to build a relationship with them. You know, a little bit, you know, vicariously, kind of live vicariously through them. Then they just, you know, they move back to their home country and then they just stop making videos. And, I don't know. I, I have feelings about that that, uh, you know, aren't really positive. But, you know, it's their life. It's their channel. You know, they just got to do what they got to do. So, um, but yeah, I was really influenced by all those people to come out to Japan. And when I eventually did come out here in 2013, I was really excited. And I decided to make those types of videos that, you know, I basically, well, not really grew up because I was an adult at the time, but just basically, you know, watched and watched and was like, man, I wish you could live that life and, you know, go to those places and see those things in real life, not just on a computer screen or something like that. It was really cool. And I just, I just really liked that style of video making. So, um, back when I was still living in the States, I really wanted to you know, make J-Vlogs and get out to Japan and do that sort of thing. But I didn't really have the finances or really just the means in general to get out here. You know, like I said, I was in between jobs, broke, living paycheck to paycheck. So I didn't really have 
any means of coming out here. So I was really depressed because it's like, I want to make these awesome videos, I want to come out here, but there's really no way at the time to make it happen. So I was contacted by one of the uh, original J-Vloggers, although he doesn't really associate with uh, the term J-Vlogger, he kind of does his own thing. Uh, Kurt Bell of the Softy Papa and Lyle's Brother channel, among others, but the Softy Papa channel is his main channel. So he was one of the, uh, one of the first uh, quote-unquote J-Vloggers out there, but he didn't really associate with that term, he didn't really bond with the community that much over it. It's freaking bugs. Anyway, <laughs> so I was contacted by him. I believe he either sent a comment or sent me like a, a message through uh, YouTube's private message, the messenger saying stuff like, well, you know, why don't you show off stuff in your hometown? You know, why don't you kind of do the J-Vlog thing, but not in Japan? So you can still do like the J-Vlog style, you know, just, hey guys, you know, this is the cool little lighthouse, or this is the lake, or, you know, just basically showing off stuff in your hometown and just like the surrounding areas, because, you know, not everybody's been to, you know, Salina, Ohio, or Coldwater, Ohio, or just the area where I grew up. They haven't, a lot, a lot of people haven't been there, so, it, you know, while it may be kind of mundane and just kind of boring to me, because I've seen it all my life, you know, somebody who hasn't seen that, uh, would find it really interesting and might really like the uh, the German style architecture, which is uh, characteristic of that part of Ohio. So I decided to uh, get my trusty San Exacti camera, which I was rocking at the time, and just showed off various little places. Like I remember showing off a little bike path that I would take in order to get into town because uh, my parents lived out in the country at the time. So there was a little bike path that was nearby, so I just kind of cut across and just take that so I could avoid uh, most of the traffic. So I showed off that little area, went to the uh, lighthouse in Salina, and just was like, hey, you know, this is the lighthouse, this is the lake, yay. <laughs> and that was the beginning of my Life in Video series. It originally started off as Life in Video, but I decided to think it was kind of cool to have like a, a cool acronym with it. So life in video, L-I-V, live. So I decided to add the A at the end, so it was like alive. Eh, it was just a cool little thing I thought of. So A life in video, alive. So uh, I decided to rename it a life in video. And I, sh I did the J-Vlog style video, but in my hometown and the surrounding areas and stuff like that. And it, it kind of, I, I saw it kind of as training, I guess, to prepare myself for when I would eventually come out to Japan. So I would, you know, automatically kind of know, know what I was doing with making videos and stuff like that. And I could just hop right in. So, of course, you know, even coming out to Japan, there is still a learning curve. There are certain Japanese customs and courtesies and stuff like that that are different than in America. You know, you can't just walk into a convenience store and just start filming and recording people and going to parks and recording, you know, children, even, you know, accidentally, because, you know, some people get mad about that sort of thing because it's privacy and stuff. But, you know, potato, potato. <laughs> so, yeah, there was a bit of a learning curve coming out here. But that's okay. It's all part of the process, right? So, yeah, like I said, came out here in May of 2013. And this is actually my two-year anniversary of coming out here to Japan. So I've been here, as of this, uh, as of this uh, recording, this video, I've been out here for two years. It's pretty awesome. And it's kind of sad that I'm going to be going back to the States soon. But, you know, I would love to come back out here again. You know, maybe, maybe not out to Yokosuka, but to another town, another place, another part of Japan, and just continue to explore and see new things, meet new people. So um, that's basically all I want to say in this video. It's almost at the 20 minute mark, or thereabouts, at least the raw video is. So um, I think we'll cap it off here. So yeah, this is the Andy San. Sign off from lovely Yokosuka, Japan, from my lovely balcony, which is probably about the size of a of most apartments here in Japan. But what can I say? I'm blessed. But uh, I want to thank you guys for tuning in to 100 videos about Japan, the Andy Japandi series, and for watching my other stuff. Also, want to thank you guys for liking the thumbs and the stars for you uh, old school YouTubers out there. Uh, comment, subscribing, 
send a few friends to the party. And hey, as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye.